levels. So you would be breaking up thousands of these equations. Chapter 3, 1, 2, 3. This is my Bible. I am what he says to us. Statue 
of the god of the goddess Athena, one of the biggest statues at the time. In Rhodes, there was a colossal statue of the Titan Apollos. And then in 226, an earthquake happened and it came crumbling down. There was a story even told in Japan in the 1400s of a Japanese warlord. His name was Hiradeshu. You can't say that quite nicely because if you see those Chinese movies, Hiradeshu. All right? Hiradeshu. So I'm going to say, like we said in the movie, the warlord Hiradeshu. He wanted a statue being built. A colossal one, a huge one of Buddha. It took 50,000 men five years to build. It's a long time. Five years, 50,000 men. Oh, it's a lot of money to build this huge, huge statue of Buddha. Eventually, they just finished building it. He just placed it inside the temple. The big temple was built for. You know what happened? In 226, that huh? earthquake happened. <laughs> earthquake happened. The whole temple fell down. The roof fell down on top of the statue. Destroyed it completely. So you can imagine who was upset. <laughs> <laughs> so Hiradushu comes in and he sees the destroyed thing and he takes his arrow and he shoots it at the fallen statue. And he says, I have made you at great expense. And you can't even keep your house together. Wow. <laughs> exactly. That's what I said also. That is the story for today. It's about fallen statues. The fact is that when light stands next to darkness, light always wins. So if you have your Bibles, let's begin to do this chapter. In 1 Samuel chapter 5, if you have your Bibles, please turn there. As we read about the fallen statue for the Lord. 1 Samuel chapter 5, we're reading the first. Five verses. After the Philistines had captured the Ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashton. Then they carried the Ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. When the people of Ashton rose early the next day, there was Dagon, fallen to his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. But the following morning when they rose, there was Dagon fallen to his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and hands had been broken off and were lying on the on threshold. Only his body remained. That is why to this day neither the priest of Dagon nor the others of the nor the others enter Dagon's temple at Ashdod, step on the threshold. Thank you, Danny, for that bless you. The book of Samuel chronicles the adolescent time of Israel. It was a time not yet of the kings of Israel, and it was just on the brink of ending the judges' period. Bit of a transitional period. The book of Samuel focuses on one man in the first couple of chapters, and is Eli. Eli is a high priest of Israel at that time. Eli is also the mentor and uh, protector of Samuel. Samuel is a young boy who is put into the temple. And it is Eli's job to now uh, groom him up into the temple. He'll actually become the, the last judge of Israel. At this time, Eli also had two sons, Hophni and Phineas. Hophni and Phineas were not like my two good sons. These guys were like evil buggers, right? They were like naughty, right? They done everything wrong. They were priests in the temple, yet they done everything wrong. They saw that they exploited the people of Israel. They they done their temple duties, but did not regard God, did not honor God, did not even respect God. They done their own things. And Eli was very, very perturbed about this. At this time, there was a war between the Philistines and Israel. The Philistines were always at war with Israel. Going back to the time of Judges with Samson, remember Samson? Fighting the Philistines. David, in the book of Samuel again, is fighting the Philistines with Goliath. So that's an ongoing feud for hundreds of years that Israel was fighting a war with the Philistines. At this time, they had just fought in a battle with the Philistines and they had lost. Israel lost. They were defeated. 4,000 soldiers died. They were very upset, very discouraged. So they go back to the camp and they say, oh, what are we going to do? God is not helping us. He's not fighting our battles for us. What are we going to do? So one of the elders decided, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the tabernacle and we're going to get the Ark of the Covenant. You know what the Ark of the Covenant is? Da -da -da -da. I can music in the background. Indiana Jones music in the background. Da -da -da. Ark of the Covenant. This is the Ark of the Covenant. This is my sacred object in all of Israel. It was a, a box made of wood, overlaid with gold, it had a lid on it, with two angels, the cherubim on it. They went there to touch the ark, so they had poles made, wooden poles where the priest would actually carry. Inside of the ark was three objects. Anybody know what they were? The Ten Commandments, the pot of manna, and orange bottle. Yeah. So it's a very sacred thing. This is in the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies. They never moved from there. It stayed there forever. Even in the temple, 
stay in the Holy of Holies. The people of Israel knew that the Ark of the Covenant represented the power and the presence of God. This was the glory of God manifested. When they walked around the walls of Jericho, it was the Ark that was in front. When the Israelites crossed over the Jordan River into the Promised Land, it was the Ark that was in front. So people realized that and, and knew that this represented the glory of God, the presence of God. So they thought that if they could get this off and bring it into battle with them, then God would fight the battles for them. And this would do like a magic trick, like a talisman, or like a charm, like a rabbit's foot. So that's what they do. They get the Ark of the Covenant from the tabernacle and they take it into battle. The battle took place in a place called Ebenezer. Say Ebenezer. Ebenezer. You remember Ebenezer? Yeah. They took it to Ebenezer. And then they were in the battle, so the people were fighting, the first times are coming, they run running, they put the ark down and they stand back because I don't know what they were thinking. They probably expected God to jump out of the machine gun and did, 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 did. I don't know, maybe the lightning to come flashing up like in Indiana Jones movies. That didn't happen. They put the ark down, stood back, and nothing happened. And now the Philistines are running towards him. And the Philistines defeat them royally. 30,000 men died in that battle. They just lost the battle. The day before, 4,000 people. 30,000 people died in this one battle. And man, that shocks them. They were rocked to the core. Hophnius and Phineas, the two priests, the sons of Eli, they were forefront. They were next to the ark because that was their big idea. They were killed too. So 4,000 people died, 30,000 people died. The two priests died. So the messenger goes back to Eli. He says, Eli, we've got bad news. We just lost the battle. 30,000 people died. And Ayo, your sons too, Phineas and Hophni, they also died. But then the worst news of all. Imagine the battleground. Everyone dead. Those that did survive, they ran back to the camp. So what is left? The ark. Exactly. So the Philistines see no people, they only see the ark. So they think, well, it's a great idea. Let's take the ark of the covenant. Why not? They didn't plan to do it, but there it is all alone. So they take it and they capture it. So when the messengers come back to Eli, he gets a shock. Ah, oh, 30,000 people died. Oh, my sons are dead. And then they say, they are. And the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines. And you know what happens to Eli? He steps back. He trips over. He gets such a fright that he breaks his neck and dies. The high priest of Israel is dead. And the Bible says he was fat, blind, and old. I'm not making that up. And he said in 1 Samuel chapter 5, he did. So he was fat, old, and blind. So when he fell over, the weight of it just cracked his neck. He was dead. Wow, let's recap. How many people died in the first battle? Four. The second battle? And then how many priests died? <laughs> and then high priests died. Wow, talk about a bad day for Israel. At the same time, Eli's daughter-in-law, the wife of Phineas, she was with child, she was pregnant. And at this time, she heard the news, they came to her and they told her the same news. Huh? 4,000 people died, then 30,000 people died. Oh, you know, your husband and his brother, they died in battle too. Oh, yeah, and the high priest of Israel, Eli, he's dead too. But all of this, she flips out like any woman would. Hey, Pat? Yeah. <laughs> and she goes into labor, she starts having a baby prematurely. You know what happens? As the baby comes out, you know what happens to her? She dies. Just before she dies, she names the baby Ichabod. Ichabod means the glory has departed. Man, how sad that sounds. Imagine having your son dead. Ichabod. You walk through school. What's your name, Ichabod? The glory. <laughs> you cannot smile when you say the name Ichabod. The glory. The glory. The glory is important. The Bible because the Ark of the Covenant <coughs> held the glory of God. And it was gone. Captured by the first time. Talk about a bad day. I heard about this true story. If you ever think you're having a bad day, you will think again after this story. Mr. Jones and Mr. Jones. How they couple. One day, Mr. Jones wants to get rid of all her old hairspray. So she went to the toilet at the mode and she sprayed it all in there. Because that's like a good way to go. She didn't want to throw it away because of all the environmental issues. So she sprayed all the spray out into the commode, into the toilet. Just after that, her husband came home. And as usual, he would go sit on the toilet. And as he got comfortable on the toilet, he lit up a cigarette. <laughs> you know what's coming, right? Yeah. He lit up a cigarette, he took the match, and he threw it into the commode. And BOOM! <laughs> Shot to the roof heavenward. A such an explosion that he shot up. But lucky for him, there was a shower bar and he smacked his head on it. He came crashing back down onto the toilet. So now he's got a burn backside and a concussion. <laughs> the paramedics come. 
and, and they, they're picking up him on the stretcher and they, they're just confused. They, they, they tell Mr. John, Mr. John, we don't understand. How did he get a boat back south and a concussion at the same time? So they're busy carrying him down the stairs and she tells him the story of what happened. They get so tickled and laugh about it that they drop him and he falls down the flight of stairs. <laughs> and he breaks two arms. So at the end of the day, yeah, he had a concussion, a boat bump and two broken arms. And he thought, you have a bad day. All right, Israel was having a bad day. Everything just went wrong. From the start, people down, people down in peace line, the high peace line, even Phineas' wife died. The glory had departed. What happened to the ark? The ark of the covenant was captured by the who? The Philistines. You guys are sharp group today. The Philistines. Here we have a map of Israel. Shiloh was where the ark was. In this big mountain range. And they took it to Ebenezer where the fight took place, where they lost 4,000 people and then 30,000 people. And then the ark was captured. And then brought all the way down to Ashod. Ashod in the land of the Philistines, Philistia. You can see Judah and Israel. And this is the land of the Philistines. Philistia, or the land of the Philistines, was occupied by five kings. Five kings in five cities. Ashod, Ekron, Gath, Eskelon, and Gaza. Okay? So those five kings who ruled this area. Ashod was the capital city of the Philistines. A very important one, a very big one. So the only place they could have taken the ark was into Ashod. The capital city. They didn't plan to do anything with it because they didn't even know they were going to get it. So yeah, they got the ark and they think, oh, what do we do with it? And someone said, well, let's put it into the temple of Dagon. This would be like, yeah, you know, we've got a god already. He's our chief god. Let's just put this other god next to him. Why not? And we've got two gods to worship. See how intelligent he was. And not actually understanding that they had the god of the universe with him. So they put it in the temple of Dagon. Anybody heard of Dagon before? Dagon is a, a god mentioned three times in the scriptures, one in the Apocrypha. And he was called the fish god. And we've got a picture of Dagon, the fish god of Egypt. He's represented most times as a half fish, half man. Most uh, other times he's represented as a man with the peril of the fish on him. He's called the fish god. Philistines were uh, Mediterranean people, seafaring people, so it's uh, natural that they would have a god on the sea. The, the nice term they've given to him, which I like, is the god of storms. Dagon was called the god of storms. In Babylonian literature, he's called the god of the wind. In Arabic literature and mythology, he's called the god of the rain. So this is the god of the storms. And the practice that was associated with Dagon was child sacrifice, ritual prostitution, and self-mutilation. All good things, eh? You wouldn't want to go to that church sometime? No? Anybody? No? All right. So you thank goodness you come to say Marx, eh? But it could be worse than that. Not good things. When, when I think of Dagon, uh, there's nothing good associated with this guy. He's a god of storms, a god of death, a god of destruction, a god of decay. So this is a god that they worship, the chief god. So in that temple there was a statue of Dagon. You can imagine it as either one of these. It was a huge statue. And then they put the Ark of the Covenant next to it. And I need you to see the, the geography of this, the logistics of this. I've got my Ark of the Covenant here. I don't know where this is from actually. And don't laugh. If you want to build me an ark, you can, alright? <laughs> Compliments of Cisco. The Ark of the Covenant. Now we're going to get. So this is the Ark of the Covenant, a box. And they, they didn't just put it in the temple like that. No, they, they put it somewhere specific to Bible says. They, they put it next to Daniel. Beside him. So if the ark was here. And Daniel was here. Do you see that? It was next to him. And I can imagine the whole animated dialogue going on because this is Dagon, this is his temple, and he's looking at this little god. He says, Oh, well, look at how like small you are, look how big I am. Ooh. This is my house, this is my temple. You just, you talk and spoken to, all right? Say, I'm the boss here, all right? And just move over to the left, all right? This is Dagon's place, he's the boss, he's in charge here. And he's talking to God and the Ark of the Covenant, and does it do anything? No. The Ark does nothing, it keeps quiet. Remember Jesus last week? He just ignores the people. I told you, it's a very powerful lesson in the Bible. When people are ragging you and talking negative and trashing you down, just ignore them. Alright, that's what God does. So, right. so here he was right next to him. They captured the Ark of the Covenant. The Philistines. They captured the glory of God. They had it in the temple. Do you know that we're living in a time of 21st century Philistines? They want nothing more than to capture the glory of God. There are spirits out in the world. Forget about Harry Potter and all that. There are spirits in the world today that are alive and well. And these spirits want to capture the glory of God. They want to capture your glory. They want to silence the truth. 
I've shown you that now, the Ten Commandments. There's people out there determined to destroy the things of God and take it away from us. And we should stand against these spirits. There's a spirit of Pharaoh that is alive and well that's keeping the children of God in bondage. <coughs> There's a spirit of Goliath that is still out there mocking and humiliating us. The spirit of Jezebel that is causing us as Christians to hide in caves. But you know what? There's a greater spirit out there. A spirit greater than all these other spirits. And that's the Holy Spirit of Almighty God. And you know, I, know, I may be one of the few, but I still believe that Jesus saves. I still believe that He heals. I still believe that He redeems and restores. I still believe that Jesus is coming back again. Anybody else believe those things? Amen. Because there's not many Christians that believe that. I believe that no matter what happens, Jesus is still going to win at the end of the day. When light stands next to you, darkness, light always wins. So we have this picture of Dagon, this big guy, and the Ark of the Covenant. So they leave it. The next morning they come inside. The priests come in. And they knock on the door. And they open up the door. And they, they want to see how Dagon and God is doing. Yahweh and the Ark of the Covenant. And Dagon is not on his feet no more. Isn't that weird? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Dagon's fallen out of the tipsy. Maybe like my mom used to say. She said, yeah, a bit too much. Well, I'm getting the tipsy. Maybe he got a bit tipsy and fell over. Dagon fell over. They come in and they see Dagon on the floor. But what I want you to get is that the Bible says three specific things about how he fell. It says that he fell face down. Say face down. Face down. Before the ark. Alright. So now I'm going to show you this. So it says, here's the ark. Here's Dagon. For those who can't see, must stand up. And, and, and Dagon falls. But he doesn't just like fall. He falls face down. Are you watching? I only going to do this once, alright? Oh, this grey area is not for that one, alright? If I get down, I might not get up. Talking to the help from home. And, and they going to fall face down. Are you, are you seeing me? I can see some of your sleepy feet from here. And, and I don't know about you, but it's like a hard way to fall, don't you think? It's not like a natural way, even to fall against the wall. No, you fell face down. Don't got me. He <laughs> <laughs> fell face down. And you know, when I look at that picture and I think about it in my mind, I'll just show you practically how it looks. That's a sign of worship. It's a sign of submission. It's a sign of surrender, isn't it? And they come in and they see David on like that. And you know what they do? They just pick him up. They don't think there's anything wrong with that. They just pick David up and put him back in his place. A God that has been picked up and put back in his place is not a God at all. All right? So they put him back up. Why do they do that? Because that's what people do. We do that. When things fall down, we pick it up again. There's too many Christians that are going through life resurrecting what God has already crucified. Oh. There's too many people and too many Christians that are going about trying to put back what God has already broken down. There's resources and people and relationships in your life that people want to bring back. God is saying, let it go, man. Let it go. It's in the past. What God is taking away, it was there for a purpose. Let it go. Don't put it back up or again. And that's what we do. When things fall down, you don't worry about God. Oh, God will just put it back up again. We'll fight the same battle again and again. So where's Dagon? Next to the ark again. Yay! Everyone's happy. They go out. The next morning they come, they knock on the door, they open up, and where's Dagon now? He's falling down again. <coughs> Bible says it again, the same thing. He fell down, face down. Before the ark. So I'm going to do that again just in case you missed it. Are you with me? Alright, face down before the ark. This is the last time I'm doing this, brother. <laughs> Alright, so there he is. But now it's something different. It adds on something. It says that his head and his arms are broken off too. I can't do that. Right? <laughs> I thought about it, but it's not going to happen, guys. Unless somebody wants to chop my head off. So the vine, face down before the ark, but this time. His head was broken. His arms were broken. You know what that means? God was saying, hey, he's not getting up again. He's down and he's going to stay down. Who watches Rocky? Yes. Alright? He's staying down this time. Alright? Rocky always gets up, not there you go. You know, sometimes in life we, we go through a process and we're going to do things over and over and over. We don't just over overcome the addiction and the sin. We don't just overcome the problem. Sometimes we've got to put it up and we've got to fight the battle again. Sometimes the devil puts it up in life. Sometimes we stand next to problems and God puts it there for a purpose. You know, every time there's something coming up in our lives, 
But thank God there's a day when the statues fall. And when they fall, God will say, never, ever again. You know what today is? Never, ever again. Say that with me. Never, ever again. Because you're standing next to problems. You're standing next to bacons in your life. You're standing next to rebellion, fear, failure, mistakes. You're standing next to sickness and death. We all have these problems now. We all have bacons next to us. Today the bacons fall. And when they fall, they will be broken. And God will tell you, they gone before, and He will never, ever get back again. We all go through storms. Remember I spoke about the God of storms. Ah, there's a beautiful picture in the New Testament that parallels the story. Jesus on the boat, on the Sea of Galilee, and there's a storm. Do you remember? There's a storm raging. And where is Jesus? Do you remember? He's sleeping. What is the hog doing? Nothing. What is Jesus doing? Nothing. There's sometimes in life where God tells us, like the psalmist says, be still and know that I'm God. There's sometimes we go to back off and say, God, I can't fight this no more. I can't do this battle no more. So I'm going to just leave it to you and I'm going to just let you be who you are. The ark didn't do anything. Jesus was sleeping. The God of storms was there raging around the disciples. Jesus gets up and he says three words. You know what those three words were? Peace. Be still. Echo in what the psalmist said. Be still. And know that I am God. And sometimes we're going to just stand back and say, God, it's your battle. God didn't have to do anything. And Dagon fell and crashed. We all say the next few problems today. Dagon's in our life. It's time for us to be still and hand it over to God and say, God, this statue, this Dagon of death and destruction is going to fall. And when is it going to fall? It's going to fall today. We're going to stand in faith and rise up against the spirits of the world. Rise up against all the anarchy and all the tyranny that's coming against the church. And we're going to stand firm in the word of God. Saying, God, you can break my day on. You can make them fall. And I know when they fall, Lord, just like you said in your word, it will never, ever come back again. I said before, when light stands next to darkness, light always wins. That I get from this verse. John 1, 5. The lightning shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. When light sends this to darkness, say it with me, light always wins. There's a story I read about this boy John Smith. He was walking with his three friends on a frozen lake in St. Louis, Missouri, America. But the lake was thawing out and the three boys fell into the lake. Two of the boys managed to come out, but the third boy, John Smith, stayed under for 15 minutes. Has anybody been in a frozen lake before? You have no idea. <laughs> he fell under for 15 minutes. By the time the pyramids came, they got him out. He was already blue. He was dead. They tried all they could to resuscitate him. For 27 minutes, they tried to bring this boy back to life. He had already been dead now. 27 minutes plus 15 minutes. They quickly got him in an ambulance, rushed him to the hospital. By the time they got to the hospital, he had been dead. 45 minutes. Dead. The doctor on duty, he looked at him and done all he could. Eventually, he put the cloth over the boy's head and said, he's dead. By that time, his mother was walking in. He walked towards his mother and said, ma'am, I'm sorry, your son is dead. The mother walked right past him. Notice, ignored him. See where that comes from? She ignored him. She walked straight to the boy. And she started to pray out aloud. The doctor actually noted afterward and said that she began to pray very loudly. There's sometimes we've got to pray softly in our little war room. But there's sometimes we've got to pray loud that the devil and his demons know that we are coming. And we're coming with a force of vengeance. She prayed loudly and she said, Oh God, let your Holy Spirit come into my boy and give him life again. Doc was shocked and said, man, the son is dead, he's 45. 45 minutes and he's dead. She prayed and said, God, let the Holy Spirit bring my boy back to life. She was not going to tolerate the Dagon of death over her son. She knew that the statues and Dagons would fall. She would not tolerate darkness in her life. She stood firm on God's word. You know what happened next? The boy came back to life. He sat up, his heart started beating. The doctor was shocked. He flipped out. 
Immediately your angular voice started checking his brain function. Perfect. Heart function, perfect. This boy was in perfect condition after 45 minutes of being dead. God brought him back to life. The doctor on duty, he had to write the report out. You know, doctors do that. And at the end of the report, he has to know, right, what happened to this boy? And doctors don't necessarily get mixed up in religion and spiritual stuff. They may not science. But you know what this doctor wrote in his final report? He said, I cannot explain it. Science does not explain it. But I know that this boy came back to life because of the Holy Spirit of Almighty God brought him back to life. This boy, John Smith, is alive and well. There he is. He's here talking to his buddies in the hospital. Looks like he's fine, happy. He's happy, healthy, and old today. The day of death was over his life. His mother had a problem next to her. But she knew without a shadow of a doubt that when light stands next to darkness, who always wins? Light always wins. You cannot put the God of life next to the God of darkness because the God of life will win. You cannot put the God of light next to the God of darkness because the God of life will always win. In your life, we are going through problems. We have Dagons coming up, rising up against us. Let me tell you that no matter what hell rises up against, no matter what the devil and demons try to put up and erect in your life, those Dagons cannot do anything because there is a mightier God fighting for you today. The God of the universe. He's not even the God of a box. That's what was wrong with the Israelites. They thought that they could capture God in a box. How ridiculous God is not the God of the box, He's the God of the universe. That's the God you and I serve. Today in your life, there are days right next to you, problems, failure mistakes, sin, addictions, sickness. I know, we've all been through those storms. The good news today is the Dagons will fall. And when they fall, they will be broken. Their head and hands will be broken off. And they will never, ever return. Why? Because when life sends us to us, life always wins. If you believe and receive this today, and I believe and declare that not only will you overcome the problems and obstacles and challenges that you are facing today, but I do believe and declare that you will become your reason. That God created you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Let us sing our last song. My life. I thought you would saw that coming, right?
happens if you miss the minister, by the way. <laughs> that happens if you don't pay your tires. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us in worship and we're coming up for one week.